Christina Hess, welcome to the Keto Camp Podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. I'm excited to chat with you. You're doing some great work out there, and you have an amazing event coming up ahead uh, this year in May. But before we talk about all that, what's your story? How, how did you get involved with what you're doing today? Share with the Keto Campers your story. So Ben, um, I'm a licensed dietitian nutritionist in clinical practice, and um, my personal story is that um, of a few years back, I found myself uh, very stressed out of managing my practice. I was finishing up uh, grad school. I'd started my practice as a health coach and then decided to get my uh, clinical nutrition degree, and I was commuting from Connecticut to Maryland for school and um, and just just juggling a lot of balls. And so uh, I found myself actually gaining weight through school and um, 20 pounds heavier at the end of school, <laughs> not where you want to be when you finish a, a nutrition degree. Um, I decided to employ all the previous strategies that had worked before, a lot of exercise and, um, you know, just dialing back a little bit of sugar, but not definitely it wasn't doing keto, but my weight, despite the fact that I was training for triathlons and doing all that didn't budge. So I felt like something was just metabolically off with me and I got some blood work done and realized that I was creeping towards prediabetes. And it really surprised me. It really threw me for a loop. I mean, my fasting glucose was high 90s. It wasn't what a doctor would consider a problem, but I knew that was just not okay. And I also knew that at the time that I should should do a ketogenic diet because it was a protocol I had put other people on, but was kind of feeling um, resistant to doing myself until uh, I went to a conference, a nutrition conference down in DC um, with the American College of Nutrition and Professor Thomas Seafried, who is speaking at my event, um, gave a brilliant talk on cancer and ketogenic diet as an adjunct therapy. And it was kind of like one of those, um, you know, catalytic moments where you're like, that's, I'm doing this. I have to do this. And because um, I do work inside of an oncology practice um, a couple of these, uh, a couple of times a month, I, you know, I knew that I had to, I had to dive more deeply into um, ketogenic diet and do this for myself. Most importantly, do it for myself because I was kind of walking around feeling like this nutrition fraud had sort of imposter syndrome. Like I'm overweight for myself and I don't feel good in my body and my lab markers aren't where they should be. So um, I need to take some action. And, and so a couple of years ago, I, I started keto and honestly, I've, it, it was life changing and I've never looked back. So um, even though it's not the protocol that I put absolutely everybody on, um, it's now a majority of my practice is doing some kind of version of a ketogenic diet. That's really, really cool that you, um, because you're a licensed uh, dietitian and nutritionist, and it's not common for most of them to be following or, or teaching or <laughs> anything keto because they have a negative connotation with it. So do you uh, expect that, or I imagine you've gotten some backlash from that? What are, what are some things that you've, you've seen from your, your, uh, your peers? Uh, well, it's, it's actually, um, I've, I've been pleasantly surprised that more and more healthcare practitioners are open to it. Um, but you're right. You're absolutely right. The majority, um, don't even know what 
what ketosis is. And, and the way I explain is that there, there are multiple ways to get into ketosis, you know, so, um, so, so a person can tailor how they do it to foods they feel comfortable eating, feel good eating, and, um, and, and yeah, and there's no one, you know, one right way to, to do that. But I've actually been pleasantly surprised, Ben, at how, how many doctors out there, at least with um, my clientele, are, not, are, are supporting them. And they're seeing that they're, they're having great results. They're coming off of you know, blood pressure medication and other medications and, and losing the weight. And um, you know, so it's hard to argue with results. And, you're right. um, you know, so they just, they say, I don't know what you're doing, but keep doing it. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. And, you're, and keto is very popular nowadays and people are doing their own research. They're actually giving their doctor books to read. And it's a, a new day and age out there, which is a, a double-edged sword because you can get the wrong information and, and go that direction or you get amazing information. So it's very yeah. important to really know what you're doing and who you're studying and make sure they have a proven track record. Like you have a proven track record. You're helping people out. So I, I love that story. What, what is your favorite benefit for you personally um, when it comes to ketones? What, what, what's your favorite thing about it? Well, um, so this is going, going back in time, but historically um, I think I had undiagnosed PMDD. And so for anyone listening out there, that's uh, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. This like, years of um, whenever I'd have my period, I would feel very depressed and very blue for like three or four days. And it, it kind of, uh, the way I describe it is, is like being hijacked. You know, your body gets hijacked and, and you're not yourself and you kind of go very dark and and then, you know, hormones, you get your period and everything, the sun comes back out. And, and so I, I sort of li li lived without really understanding um, what was going on with me hormonally for years until I changed my diet for the better. Um, I started doing CrossFit probably back in 20, uh, 2010. And I don't CrossFit today, but, um, but I switched to a paleo diet way back then. And it completely, um, it, it, may, it had some, you know, huge changes uh, right then. And I also started taking a supplement called SAM-E. And with those two things, you know, I, I saw um, the PMDD resolve. But fast forward to keto. And now I don't have any of the physical symptoms of PMS. So no cramps. I mean, I used to be a person who had to take prescription naproxen to kind of get through the first couple of days. And um, so, so I had resolved a lot of the, the mood piece before, but the, um, the physical symptoms I still struggled with until um, I started keto, and and that um, you know besides you know weight regulation and great sleep, great energy, just great overall mood because you feel so happy. You know Maria Emmerich calls it the happy diet, um, and and I I kind of lovingly call it keto high when you're running on ketones, but um, really just not having any physical symptoms uh, around menstruation is huge and game changing for, <laughs> for a woman. So um, for your female listeners, I mean, maybe they can relate to uh, changes with that. Yeah, it's amazing. I love that. You know, I, I say the great land of ketosis. So it's funny how we all have these different sayings and you just, <laughs> yeah. it's a feeling that when you are in ketosis, I don't even have to even check my ketones. I know when I'm in ketosis, you just, I feel it. Me too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and um, what about for, so a lot of people come to keto uh, for the weight loss benefits and they stay for the health benefits. 
Yes. Because you're reducing inflammation when you do it the right way, healthy keto. You're yes. balancing your hormones like you just attested to. And then a side effect will be the weight will come off. Now, that transition from going from being a sugar burner, which most people are, to being a fat burner could be tough. And you have an article on your website about sugar, how to break up with sugar. Could you give some tips on people who are listening right now who are just still having those carbohydrate cravings and sugar cravings? What are some tips they can do? Yeah, and I will say that um, I, I, I grew up in Italy. I lived on pasta every day, <laughs> all through my 20s. I love carbs, right? But they don't love me back is you know how, how I feel about them. And um, the, the way to, first, you have to really get clear on a good reason why. You know, you have to have a strong um, inner, inner driver that's going to be just beyond, I need to lose 10 pounds. Like, but why do you need to lose 10 pounds? What, what are you going to get out of it? So that, that's a more psychological piece that people have to get in touch with that I, I help my clients identify. And, um, and the, and the other key is having some treats in place. And so there are plenty of wonderful, low carb, keto friendly desserts and treats that can keep you from feeling deprived. You know, it's, it's miraculous that there's keto chocolate and keto hot chocolate and, and there are keto cookies. And, you know, so, um, I think when people think that keto is too restrictive, they just, they haven't um, realized that there are all these other great options out there so that there is no deprivation because diets don't work. You have to find a lifestyle. You have to find something that you can execute day in and day out without deprivation. Yeah, absolutely. And you're right. There's so many available products out there that are keto friendly. Yeah. Now, with that being said, there's also products out there that are keto friendly, but they're not necessarily healthy. Correct. Uh, they have inflammatory oil, oils. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that. What, what are some of the things that you teach your clients uh, when it comes to healthy keto versus dirty keto? Can you distinguish yeah. between the two? Yeah. So we, we aim to do clean keto. Um, and I, I teach that it's, it is more inflammatory to put in um, refined seed oils than sugar. So if someone's really trying to clean up, we want to start there. Um, and we also talk a lot about alcohol. I mean, a lot of people, you know, think, oh, it's okay. I, I'm doing keto so I can, and I can still drink lots of alcohol. And, and I'm just, you know, not on board with that. Um, if someone is not having results on keto, it's typically um, because they're still putting in a lot of inflammatory things into their body. They're still drinking, they're having too much dairy, they're eating too many nuts, and they're having these keto snacks that, um, you know, say they have the label keto on them, but they're not. <laughs> they're, they're, they're a lot of carbs or a lot of poor ingredients. So the simpler, the better. And so we do, we do practice some label reading and, um, and look for, you know, less, fewer ingredients. So if somebody, so your tip is, is for somebody to transition from processed sugar to keto, healthy, keto friendly treats, they have keto cookie, keto chocolates. And I agree with you. You said those uh, vegetable oils, industrial seed oils are much worse than sugar. I agree. Uh, so that's the first step. Remove those inflammatory oils, which are keto friendly, but they're not health friendly. Right. So you start there, you reduce your inflammation, and then you can start making that transition. Uh, and I'm curious, how do you teach keto to your clients? Do you teach them to just go all in right from the beginning and kind of embrace the suck and, and go cold <laughs> turkey? Or do you have a process? Uh, how do you teach it to them? I do have a process. So um, I tell them that it really takes 72 hours for the body to, to get off sugar. And that's, that's pretty true for any substance, that um, any substance lasts for 72 hours in the body. So those first three days are critical. And so we do want those first three days to be as clean as possible. And, um, and I encourage them to start with 
uh, three, three meals a day and a snack those first three days so that they're not hungry. And then after that, once the sugar is out of their system, then we, we start with a smaller eating window. We aim to get down to two meals a day or one meal a day. And, um, but we start with something that looks more traditional the three meals and a snack and just, you know, have, have eggs and bacon, get yourself to the next meal, have a salad, maybe have uh, some kind of, you know, crudite or snack in the afternoon and then, um, and then have a, a dinner, protein and vegetables. And that's how we start. And, um, and I say simpler, the better. Don't, don't be thinking you need to make elaborate recipes. And um, once you get the, those first three days are critical, drinking a lot of electrolytes and talking about how the body, you know, loses water and loses minerals and that electrolytes are critical. And we talk about keto flu and feeling badly and that that's, you know, all, all part of the transition. But the, you know, more electrolytes going in, less likely they are to feel badly. Yeah, I agree. Electrolytes are, are key, especially as they make that first transition. Those are great tips. So what about somebody who you've been working with and they um, are fixated on the number on the scale and they're like, oh, Christina, I just, I, I just want to see that number go down. I can't they see it go are. down. Yeah. <laughs> they all are. I see it a lot. Um, so what, what, are, what advice would you give them? So I have a, um, a body composition analyzer. It's uh, by Tanita. And it prints out it prints out a lot of things, prints out a lot of numbers. And so uh, this this printout is really important because we we talk about muscle mass, we talk about hydration, cellular hydration, we talk about visceral fat. We, we're talking about other things besides the number on the scale, and um, but we also celebrate a loss. You know, if, you know, I have people come in, they're very hard on themselves and they may have only lost a pound, but it's still a pound. And, and they, I, I, I have a little happy dance I do and, and I celebrate it. Um, but most importantly, a big thing for me is I don't want people to feel judged. I want them to feel safe when they come and see me um, because, you know, when you, when you work in clinical practice with real people, <laughs> they're, they're dealing with a lot of life things. And, and so um, a lot of my work is very therapeutic. I'm just listening and supporting them through what's going on in their life. And, and I also remind them it's, it's about just doing better and better, not about being perfect. So um, even if they're just kind of staying low carb, that's, that's better than going all the way back to 400 grams of carbohydrate a day. You know, it, it, they don't have to chase the ketones and be in ketosis every time. That's not necessarily the goal. So, um, you know, so, so a lot of what I do is, is – is just support, you know, support and accountability. And, um, and yes, we, we talk about a lot more than just the number on the scale. Yeah. So important support and account accountability underrated and so important. So you, you're doing great work with your, with your clients. What, what about somebody who has hit a, a plateau with their results? They're just not feeling as good anymore. You also did the, the, the Tanita on them. They're just not showing the results you want. What are some things you do to mix it up for them? Well, um, something that I learned from Dr. Mercola, listening to him and reading um, his work, is that, um, and he believes in cycling, in carb cycling when appropriate. And so, and I do too. Um, uh, my goal, my goal for um, my, my people that work with me is to is to have metabolic flexibility. And and so sometimes when they've hit a plateau and they really are. Um, really staying strict, it's time to cycle them out. 
and just and do and do that reset, refill glycogen stores and do a, and do a reset. Um, I know there's some really hardcore folks out there that would just cringe at my saying that, but um, but I I don't personally want the liver to start producing glucose on its own. So um, that if, if they've hit a plateau and we've covered all the bases of, well, do you need to dial back your dairy or eliminate it entirely? Or are you, are you snacking? Are you eating too late? Um, do you need to kind of do some alternate day fasting? We, we try some other strategies, but at the end of the day, you know, if let's say they're really not consuming sugar and they're not in ketosis and they're really low carb, then it's time it's it's time to uh, cycle out, and we're talking about one meal. I'm not talking about a week long vacation. So, yeah. um, and that often helps. I've seen I've seen some people drop drop weight um, after uh, carb cycling. Yeah, absolutely. I love it because you're changing things up, and anytime you make the body adapt you'll continue getting results like a good personal trainer and you did a CrossFit. I used to own a CrossFit gym. No way. The work, yeah. The workouts always changed. They were consistently changing up because it kept the body guessing and kept the results going. So yep. it's the same thing here. We got to mix things up. I, I, I personally teach the members of the Keto Camp Academy a four pillar approach to get adapted, to practice fasting, and then to phase out almost all carbs for a short period of time. And mm-hmm. then I throw in a flex day where they have a high healthy carb day which is low carb ish paleo, like 100, 200 grams, but it kind of stokes the fat burning and they go back into ketosis, but they have achieved the metabolic flexibility, like you said, by this point. And I actually learned this from Dr. Pompa, who's my coach and mentor, and he taught it to, to Joe Mercola. So ah. it's, it's so funny how this, this circle goes and it works. It really works. So yeah. you're doing, you're doing, those are great tips. If you're listening to this and you're stuck, uh, you got to change it up. It might be the dairy, like Christina says. It might be that you're like you're eating too late at night. And I saw a video of you did an interview on YouTube. You were talking about sleep tips, and we'll transition yeah. into that. And we follow the same philosophy. One of the worst habits to have is eating right before bed. So what are the what are the what's the problem with eating and snacking too late at night? So the problem with eating at night is that, um, and I think this came from research by Dr. Panda. Yeah, is that. Uh, the pancreas and actually all of your organs, they, they shut down when the sun goes down. They, they go dormant. They go to sleep. So the beta cells in your pancreas are dormant. And when you eat, you produce insulin no matter what you eat. So eating at night, especially, you know, the darker it is, um, the, the worse. And we have photoreceptors all over our body. So the body knows that it's dark. The body kind of knows you might be a, a night owl, but eating at midnight is, it's not a good idea. So um, in one of Dr. Panda's studies, he, he, uh, he did a study with type two diabetics and uh, asked them to stop eating by 7 p.m. And then do a 13-hour circadian fast, so not eat again until eight. And um, and then they had to photograph all their food. So those are two things that I tell every single person to do. I have an app that I use, and and they photograph everything and submit it to me. And um, and I tell them to stop eating by seven. Now some people, you know, it's not realistic for them. They might stop by eight, but that's you know that's fine. And, um, and with that, in that study, the, all those type two diabetics got off of their insulin. It's mm. pretty amazing. And they weren't told what to eat, which also goes to show that people kind of, they can be their own best nutritionist. They, they know what they're supposed to eat. Mm-hmm. That's a really cool study. Yeah. You're so right. And that's one of, of many reasons why we don't want to eat before bed. It also takes a lot of resources to digest food and if you're eating before bed, then your body is not going to be using those resources for healing, for fat burning and uh, yeah. flushing out toxins from the brain, all the cool things that happen. So it's, it's a problem. And that's a lot of people, they sleep on sleep. They don't focus on quality sleep. 
So let's no. talk a little bit more about that. What are some other tips you share for, for improvement in sleep quality? Oh my gosh, I am obsessed with sleep. I think if I could go back and do it again, I would, I would be a sleep specialist. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, make the room really dark. Make your room cold. I use a sound machine. I, um, I have blue blocking glasses that I wear in the evening. Uh, shut the screens down, uh, ideally at least an hour before bedtime. Um, have, have a nice bedtime routine that signals to your body it's time to go to bed. And, um, and also if falling asleep is, is a problem, try to reset your rhythm by getting up at the same time and getting outside and getting some light into your eyeballs and exercise always helps. So, um, the more people are moving, it's going to help them sleep better. Definitely abstain from alcohol. Alcohol is metabolized all through the night. And so a person may have a glass of wine that makes them feel sleepy, but then they experience wakefulness through the night because they're metabolizing it. Um, what else? I mean, there's so many things. I, I'm such a nerd about it. I have, uh, I have a device called the Fisher Wallace. Have you heard of this? No. It's a brainstem machine. It it calms certain areas of the brain, the basal ganglia, I think it is, and then it it stimulates melatonin production. It's also it's being used um, with veterans who have PTSD, and um, it induces deeper sleep. Uh, oh, it's been kind of a light sleeper. And, and it helps me reach that Delta. Um, so does it track your sleep as well? Just it doesn't, you? it's not like an aura ring or anything like that, but it, um, I noticed it right away that it really improved the quality of my sleep. So 20 minutes, you can do it while you're watching TV or doing something else. And what, what is the device? So it's a Fisher Wallace, but what the is Fisher Fisher Wallace device? It used to be called the Circadia and it's just called the Fisher Wallace Stimulator. It's a, what, what is it? What is it? Where do you use it? On your you, head or? Yep, you put it. You put two electrodes right here, and then it has a, a band. So it's a little bit of uh, look makes you look a little crazy, but yeah. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so you wear a band around your head, and you have the two sort of things, and and you can put it. There's four different levels, and you can um, do it on a lower level and work up to a higher level. And um, the only, only people it's not um, indicated for, I think are epileptics because there's a little bit of a strobing effect. Like if you close your eyes, you, you feel like a strobe mm -hmm. effect. So um, you wouldn't want to induce a seizure or something. Yeah, like really cool. I, I haven't heard of that. How much is that machine or product? <sighs> I think it, they, they run specials on it sometimes. I think it runs about $700. And, um, and it, you, you just, you need some kind of approval from a healthcare practitioner. So, um, you know, it's not like, it's, it's not like an affiliate product. It's just, you need, you need a healthcare practitioner say that you're cleared for the device. Yeah. Very so. cool. We'll, we'll put a link for that for the Fisher Wallace product, yeah. in the notes so you can check it out. Uh, I'm going to check it out myself. I haven't heard of that before. Let's uh, let's transition into what I believe is very important and also underrated, which is mindful eating. Yes. We talk about mindful eating. So why why is that important? What is mindful eating, and why is it important? Yes, we. Um, gosh, mindfulness is it's so it's so important for the times we live in because we're, we have so much technology, we're, we're living really fast paced lives and we're easily distracted, right? The, the phone alone is, it's very distracting. So um, we haven't really learned how to just be and be present. And so how that spills over into eating is that uh, a lot of folks are, you know, eating on the run, 
eating too quickly, um, eating in front of the TV or eating well on the phone. And, and so there's, there's a lack of presence even just with the food eating and digesting process. And um, people sometimes forget what they've eaten because of that. So there's, you know, mindful eating is about slowing things down, really savoring and appreciating the food, tasting the food, really activating all the senses and um, identifying different levels of hunger, fullness, satiety, and your emotional state. Because with emotional eating, there's usually a, uh, an uncomfortable feeling that we are trying to suppress through the act of eating and comforting ourselves. And so mindful eating teaches how to start to uh, bring awareness to our feelings, actually feeling them and not using food as the solution. Yeah, so important. Uh, I, I used to be somebody who used to just stuff my, myself with, uh, I had a void in my life and I would fill it with food and I didn't know what I was doing back then and I wasn't conscious of it. Now I'm aware of what I was doing. So that's such an important tip and it's underrated, but it's, it's key. It's key to healing the body, just being present in general yes. and being mindful of what you're eating and being grateful for that food, where it came from, all the things that had to go on for it to be produced, to be right in front of you. So I love Absolutely. that you share that. Uh, let's talk about community. Um, I was sharing before we, we hit the record button that I did a, a recent video on keto for beginners. And one of the tips was to be a part of a community because I believe we become our environment, good or bad. Yes. <laughs> if you hang around five people who hate keto and hate uh, intermittent fasting and think it's the craziest thing in the world and they're unhealthy yeah. and they're broke, then it, chances are we're going to be that sixth person who fit right along with them. So how, how important is community? And let's talk about the keto symposium event taking place in May that you're hosting, which uh, amazing lineup of speakers, we'll, which we'll talk about. So, but first, how important is community? And then we'll talk about your event. Oh, it's huge. Well, we're social creatures, right? So community is huge. Um, I feel like my, my, my practice really changed when I started keto myself because there was so much I wanted to share. And um, I felt like my own clientele that was doing keto, they were also teaching me so many new things. And, and um, so I, I started a monthly group called keto round table so my you know my clients come and and they they share their journey you know sometimes I do a lecture sometimes we watch uh you know the latest movie like we just watched fat the documentary it was awesome yeah and um but community is so important just to also hear you know what's working with you know with other people or what they're struggling with or what like what if someone's off track, maybe they can hear from someone else in the group, uh, you know, a hot tip or suggestion, um, you know, and it's also just a place to feel heard and, and feel supported. So yeah, I, I'm a huge advocate of community, I think. Um, and then just having that group, it, it just was so nice for, for people. Um, and good for me too. Yeah. But um, yeah, Keto Symposium was- How did was, that manifest? Yeah, tell us about that. How, how did, did that create, come about? Yeah, yeah so, so, I, um, so I, had, I had signed up for a course, uh, a Tony Robbins and Dean Graziosi course called KBB, Knowledge Business Blueprint. And it's about running masterminds. And, and so, um, it's just, it was something that, it was a topic that interested me and, and cause I'm, I was thinking I would like to do something, you know, around keto and masterminding keto. And, um, and I thought, wow, this would be so, it'd be so cool to have a big keto event in our area. Um, I, I live in Connecticut and I'm, we're located right outside Manhattan and there, there hasn't been anything uh, keto related locally. You know, you have to travel to KetoCon or um, 
go to Metabolic Health Summit in LA. So, um, so I was talking to one of my clients, Marla, who has lost 85 pounds doing keto, and she had decided to become a keto coach through Maria Emmerich and had done Maria's program. And I was talking to Marla one day about this idea I had for a conference, a keto conference. And it just kind of started with, well, do you think Maria would be interested in participating in that? And she said, let me ask her. And so she, she did. And Maria said she'd be delighted. And so um, it, we could have just stopped with Maria and had a great event inviting Maria Emmerich to, to, to come to Connecticut. But um, we wanted it to be more than that. So, so yeah, so we have this amazing lineup of speakers and, and we also have um, vendors. So it's going to be also like an expo of, of great keto products. And, um, you know, it is a one day event. We want to expand it to a two day event um, in subsequent years. But um, yeah, we're starting with this one day event. It's uh, Saturday, May 2nd. So a few months from now, but um, you know, we hope lots of people come. It's going to be phenomenal. Yeah, it is going to be phenomenal. It, it is uh, Saturday, May 2nd. It's a one day event. It's locate. The location is Hyatt Regency in Greenwich, Connecticut. So if you're in Connecticut, yeah, in, if you're in Greenwich, Greenwich, Connecticut. Oh, Gre Greenwich, excuse me. Yeah. Greenwich, Connecticut. And if you're in Connecticut or anywhere in the Northeast, you got to be there. It's just, it's, it's so convenient yeah. for you to attend. And um, there's going to be Maria Emmerich, who's amazing. Dr. Thomas Seafried, who, who inspired you to, yes. to get into ketosis or keto. Uh, Dom D'Agostino, Dr. Will Cole, who was just on the podcast. I just was with him. Uh, Josh Perry, Mike Musso, who was also on the Keto Camp podcast. Chris Irvin, and of course, Christina Hess, who's, who's hosting it. Um, so I'm going to put a link for information to the, the keto symposium in the notes of this podcast. And if you're watching the right. YouTube video, it's down below. Uh, go get your ticket and be there and then be at the future events. We're, uh, hopefully, I'll be speaking at the next one in 2021. Absolutely. And, uh, supporting this event because community is so important. It, it's, it's really key. We are social creatures, like you said. And if you could surround yourself with people who are going to see greatness in you and you get to ask these legends questions and they get to, you get to pick their brain and get the latest in research on keto and fasting and, and so much more. It's really the place to be. And there's also going to be vendors like Christina said. So highly recommend it. Yeah. Go check I would, out the link. I would not have done keto without going to a conference. You know, uh, that's how I, I got started too. Even though I, I knew that it was the right path, I just needed that push. And, um, and I feel like, if you're, if you need a little inspiration, if you've been a little stuck or you just want some new information, you think you know everything about keto. I don't know everything about keto. Uh, none of us do. So um, we're all learning from each other. You know, I watch your videos all the time. They're fantastic. Thank and, you. Um, you know, it's, it is, it's about growing and learning and, and meeting, of, like you said, other like-minded people. You, I've made some great friends going to conferences, people I wouldn't have crossed paths with otherwise. Same here. Same here. So right on. Go check it out, Keto Campers. Go check out the link. I have my rapid fire questions for you. You ready to do this? Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> so just answer as quickly as possible. And we'll, I have about seven questions. So number one, what is your favorite keto food? Eggs. I eat eggs every day. What is your favorite non-keto food? <laughs> These days, it's not pasta anymore. It used to be pasta. It would be sushi with sushi. the rice. I thought it was going to be pasta. <laughs> <laughs> What's the first thing you think of in the morning? My dogs. Mm. What, what kind of dogs do you have? I have uh, two. Uh, they're twins. They... Uh, I rescued them from Haiti 
and um, they're mutts. They're just former little street urchins who uh, live in the lap of luxury now. Yeah, that's amazing. Good, yeah. good, good for you to do that. How old are they? They uh, just turned five. Oh yeah, mine too. Mine's he's sleeping right here underneath my oh. desk, by the way, like on my feet. He's so also quiet. yeah, he's he's knocked out. Oh, uh, uh, that's great. I love that you adopted them. He's also a rescue. The best. Uh, yeah, the best. What is speaking of the best? What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Oh gosh, that's a <laughs> best piece of advice I've ever received. Um. Well, I, I may have mentioned it before. I love, I mean, I love, love Tony Robbins and he also, he does tell what you said. He talks a lot about you, you uh, spend it, who you spend time with is who you become. So yeah, surround yourself with the right people. Yeah. Great advice. I love Tony and Dean Graziosi as well. Now, what's the worst piece of advice you've ever received? Ugh. Um, worst piece of advice. Oh, eat six small meals a day. <laughs> Keep that metabolic fire up. Totally. Yeah, I used to teach that for years. <laughs> Me too, and I feel so bad about that. Yeah, we mean we were taught we were teaching what we thought was right, and uh, we learned something different. And then that's big on you to change your thought process and now admit that you were wrong, right? So that's right? huge, right there. Yeah, it's such yeah. crappy oh. advice. What was your favorite TV show growing up? Oh gosh. Um, okay. Well, um, Michael J. Fox, um, Family Ties. Okay, and uh, if you had <laughs> <laughs> if you had one superpower. What would it be? One superpower. It would be if if I could um, like hands on heal people. Uh, yeah, if I could do that, that'd be amazing. Yeah, yeah, it would be. Okay, rapid fire is done. Now I want to ask you two more questions, then we'll wrap this up. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, what are you <laughs> What are you grateful for today? Oh gosh, so many, so many blessings. I'm. I'm grateful for my health. Um, I'm just grateful that I, I love to learn. So I am so grateful actually for the internet and technology and access to information and courses and people and just being able to access, like have the world is, is bigger because of it. Um, but there's so much to be grateful for, right? I'm, um, gr grateful to be born in this incredible time and, um, yeah, so yeah. there's so many, so many blessings. Yeah. Yeah. So many. What is your definition of perfect health? Hmm. <sighs> um, definition of perfect health. So, Having the energy and vitality to uh, be your most self-expressed. And uh, also, when you are your most self-expressed, you, you're probably in a good mood. You've probably had great sleep. You're probably moving your body. You have all your foundational things are in place. Um, you have good motility, you know, good lab markers, you look younger than your age, um, you're kind to the people around you. And, and so, um, perfect health would just be that all encompassing. So you are able to live your best life and it sounds a little corny, but so you can be your most self-expressed. Um, I can't tell you how many people are just, they don't have, they don't have energy. They don't, 
they just feel fatigued and sluggish and slow and blah. And so they don't have passion and fire and excitement and enthusiasm and uh, all the foundational things that you and I like to talk about contribute to you just being your most expressed self. Beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Where can my audience find more about your information? So Ben, my, uh, my website is thriveresultscoaching.com. Um, and I'm launching a new website called the keto nutritionist.com. And name. so that, um, that website is still, it's still being built and, um, through it, I'm going to be offering an online course and group coaching program, um, to people who can't see me in person. And, um, and so that that's not ready for launch yet, but it's in the works. Awesome. I love that name. Uh, we'll put a link for your current website in the notes and uh, I want to acknowledge you, Christina, you're doing great work. Uh, I love this conversation. I really enjoyed it. I think it really was valuable, especially when we talk about the foundational stuff, sleep, being present, surrounding yourself with community, the right community. Those foundational principles will go a long way more so than, hey, bring your macros down to this level. So I enjoyed right. the conversation. The Keto Symposium is going to be an amazing event. I acknowledge you for putting it all together. It's scary to put an event together. It's, your, it's the first one of many ahead. So um, I want to acknowledge you for showing up, for changing yeah. your way of thinking when you found out the right data. And I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you for coming on the Keto Camp Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great to talk to you, Ben. It was fun. And I look forward to seeing you at Symposium. Yes, absolutely. Let me. All right.